you have a TV? No. I just like to read the TV guide. Read the TV guide. You don't need a TV. Welcome to TV Guidance Counselor. It is Wednesday. It is time for an all-new episode of TV Guidance Counselor. I am Ken Reed, as always. I am your TV Guidance Counselor, and I am very excited about this episode this week. My guest this week is Melanie Chardoff, who most of the listeners from our show probably know as Miss Musso from Parker Lewis Can't Lose, one of my favorite shows growing up. But she's been in a million things. She continues to be in a ton of stuff. She was in Friday. She's in the infamous Andy Kaufman fight sketch. You may know her from that. She's an incredibly funny writer. She's very, very smart. She's a great, great person. And I loved recording this episode when I was out in Los Angeles. I think you'll really enjoy listening to it. Uh, just a side note, I found this very amusing. Uh, Melanie is very, very nice, and she's very funny. And when I showed up to record this episode, there were some workmen outside digging a very big, very loud hole in the street. And uh, Melanie has a real sense of authority about her and was able to somehow convince these workmen to stop working their municipal job for an hour so we could record this episode and did it in no time flat. I was very impressed. I really enjoyed talking to her. So I think you'll enjoy this episode. Sit back and listen to TV Guidance Counselor with my guest, Melanie Chardoff. Melanie Chardoff. This is a great honor to speak to you and have oh, you on the show. Oh, and an honor to speak to you. I've learned so much listening to your prior oh, thank podcasts. You. Thank you. In fact, I'm quite intimidated. Oh, really? No, I, it's, uh, I'm, I'm mostly wrong. I just make up all the stuff. They're not well, that You sound check. like you know what you're talking about. It's all about confidence. It's all about <laughs> see, the confidence. I can yeah. see. Um, and so we were, we were chatting a little bit before, and uh, I've given Melanie some, some TV guides, and she was kind of flipping through and, and trying to remember some of the shows that you watched growing up. And you grew up in Connecticut, in New Haven? In New Haven, say? home of Connecticut Bandstand, which is a cheap knockoff. They had their own con- American bandstand? bandstand. Really? Yeah. And, and we the- mostly did street dancing. I mean, I, I was taught to dan- dance by black boys, right. basically. Well, that's who you want to teach you how to dance. Yeah, we did a lot of dances that didn't make it to American Bandstand until some years later. We were ghetto. Really? So yeah. you were like, we're, we're way ahead of this curve. Yeah, we had like mashed potatoes way ahead. Oh, nice. Watusi and Wow. So when you saw it on those, you're like, they're, they're, why are they so far behind? Yeah. Why are they so far behind? But they were still our idols. You know, yeah. They were so wholesome. And they were that was on every day, correct? Or was it just Saturday? I don't know. I thought American Bandstand, well, our Connecticut Bandstand was on every day. Every day, yes. Afternoon. I think the local ones would be on every day after school, and then American Bandstand, I believe, was just Saturdays. Yes. And uh, also, New Haven's the bur- the home of the uh, the hamburger was invented there. I think. Is that true? I think the White so. Castle. Or something? Um, yeah, there's some there's some place that they invent that claims to have invented the hamburger that I remember going to. Well, we also had the best hot dogs on the really? Eastern Seaboard. They were cut in half and fried both sides. Jimmy's Shoreline oh, hot nice. dogs. Savin Rock was one of the first amusement parks in the country. Okay. It was right near my house. Did you go there frequently? Or? Oh, often. You could get all manner of things stuck on your foot. Very nice. The amusement park Very there. Nice. It was, uh, they didn't have uh, anti-littering campaigns back oh, yeah. then. It's a different time then. People just discarded everything. Throw we thought the, the world cleanliness would last forever, that yes. the air and water would just filter us forever. Oh, yeah. Well, it had for so long. Why wouldn't it now? We can't outlast them. There's we never no imagined this kind of saturation. Yes, it's yeah. true. It's true. Yeah. So, you're New Haven's of what, what, two, two hours? Hours, three hours from New York? About an hour and a half. Oh, not that far. drive fast. So did you go to New York frequently when you were growing uh, up? Not until I was allowed you know, right. to go. Uh, I could take the bus to New Haven to do bandstand. Okay. And to my go-go girl jobs. You know, I was a go-go girl for Phil Spector. You mentioned that. How, how did that happen? Well, I guess I was seen at a sock hop or dancing okay. on Connecticut bandstand, and some of his black girl acts wanted to cross over. Right. So the way he did that was by hiring two very wholesome goyish white dancers. Right, and they were Um, like, if they're hanging out with them, they must be okay. Yeah, a blonde and a brunette. I was the brunette. And we had our white fringe dresses and our white courage boots, and we danced in, in roped off little cages behind the Sweet. Ronettes, the Crystals. On television? No, this was for mixers at Yale. Okay, okay. And this is when he had just recently married Ronnie. Ronnie Spector, and, right. And uh, it was just a happening time, and then I was asked to dance with Gary Lewis and the Playboys Wow. at the Peppermint Lounge, but I was not allowed to take the train until I was 16. So how did you get to the Peppermint Lounge? I didn't go. Oh, you had no, to say no. I wasn't allowed 
allowed. Oh, Even that though must it was twenty dollars an hour, they were paid. That's pretty sure good. Sure beat the babysitting. Yeah. Money, let me tell you. That's you could even maybe take the kids along and get the double babysitting money and I the go go dancing have, money. But yeah. they couldn't stay up that late. Yeah, that's you know? true. So that was sort of my start as a performer. It was when I was fourteen. That's quite a start. Years. I know. Yeah, it was really fun. And did how did your parents react to that? I mean, how how did you approach them? Be like Phil Spector asked me to dance in a go go cage. I don't think they knew who he was. Right, he right. had an unvarnished, untarnished reputation. Right, he was just time, a yeah. young, happening Jewish man, short right. Jewish man with big ambitions in those days. Right. And I, the young woman whom I danced with was very, you know, upstanding. She was with a modeling agency. And my right. father began to see after his initial resistance that I should, actually I could make some money. Right, right. And so his resistance dissipated as the money began to come right. in. Right. That's generally how the world works, I think. Yes. It it's, didn't take me he didn't take me seriously until then. Right, right. You also, my father was such I'm sorry to interrupt. Oh, no, no, my no, father no. was such a devotee of television. The right. moment it was invented, I think he had one. And that's very unusual. So he so you always had a television in your house your whole life as far as you can Most, remember? Yeah, I can't remember not having one. Uh, the color of television came much later right, after right. I'd left. But I think it wasn't until he actually saw me inside that box that he began to pay any you respected attention you? to me at That all. is very interesting. So, so I spent the rest of my life trying to get into that box <laughs> just as often as I could. What was the first thing, we'll get uh, back to some of the things you might have watched with him when you were a kid, but what was the first thing that he watched you on? Uh, I think Connecticut Bandstand. It was Connecticut Bandstand. Yeah. And did was he sort of bragging about it to everybody? And my daughter's on TV. Or I'm not sure. I don't yeah. think he really began to brag until I had a, a series, and right. then he really, you know, began to cavell, as they say in Yiddish, right. about my abilities and my my ability to make a living. And was that be Fridays? That was the first um, regular well, I was on series. A soap run? opera oh, okay. in New York. I okay. different ones. All my children. Oh, yes, one yeah. life to live. While I was in college, I was able to commute into New York City That's and get convenient. some get my AFTRA card, which was a very big deal. Right. And audition for summer stock and do musicals and such. Right. So, so but you, I think that was the first time he took me seriously. I was on daytime television, but right. he made sure to watch it. This is a real thing now. Like yeah. she's definitely. This is not local. Uh, Connecticut Bandstand as great as that is yes uh, but I was playing special. myself on Connecticut Bandstand I was playing a character right right on uh, the doctors I played a nurse oh well, so on, these are all dramas yes and the soap operas were very dramatic very dramatic yeah. and you're you're obviously an amazing comedic actress and mostly known for comedies mm -hmm. so was it are you were you always drawn drawn to comedy and and it was odd to do the dramas first, or you kind of just fell into that? I wanted to do it all, but I seemed to have a special aptitude for comedy, because that was the way my sister and I could keep my parents from quarreling. Oh, got you. If you get a good yes. laugh, you could decoy, draw fire, yes. then they wouldn't be yelling at yes. one another. <clears throat> and, I, and so love and laughter became very correlated in my household. If you right. could make them laugh, they seemed to like you a lot. Better, yes. So. Well, that's. I think that's a very common um, theme I hear from comedians, myself included, yes. that it's a great tension breaker. It was a great distraction for families, and it's yeah, it's sort of, it's sort of just a calming presence yes. for everybody. So that kind of compulsivity to be funny is what drove me, you know, to be a performer. I think right. without that compulsivity and that childhood damage, I might not have made it. Yeah. Oh no, I think that that's also true for many of us who do yes. this. Absolutely. Yes. Uh, it's a. Uh, all of the skills you develop uh, are uh, survival. survival skills, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And you have one, just one sister growing up. I have a younger sister. Um, I'll be seeing her at my wedding. I'm getting married. Oh, right. in well, a congratulations! Few days. Yes, Thank congratulations you very on your wedding. You know, I forgot yeah. to do that until just very recently. Yeah, sometimes you forget, and it's like leaving the iron on at home. You know, you're like, I got to go back and do that. If yeah. you get married. <laughs> but and, for me, it's like kind of producing and starring in a, in a Broadway show. Only you have a long run of the play contract. Right. You know, right. it's actually going to run for a long, long time. Exactly. You to make sure the book's very good. <laughs> yes, exactly. The book is really good yeah. for this one. You don't want to close opening night on that. No. So, so you and your sister would would watch stuff almost exclusively with your dad. Was it kind of a whole family thing? We were allowed some after school watching. I remember the Mickey Mouse Club being very pivotal right. in with, my with development. Annette. Annette wasn't as appealing to me right. as um, Darlene. Okay, so she you... was an actress, and she actually starred in one of the little dramas that they did within yes. uh, the Mouseketeers uh, uh, echelons. Or, or yeah, they would have these serialized, sort of short form yeah. um, dramas and comedies throughout the week. And it yes, was like and she week. did one called Corky and White Shadow, which was okay. about a girl and her dog. Right. And I loved the story, and I began to see that she, who was such a wonderful singer, dancer, performer, could ask, actually also be an actress. Right. So I feel like Darlene, bless her ears, 
was a very big influence on me. And you can do all these things. You don't yeah. have to just pick one of these things. Yeah. Because you also, I remember there's a there's a clip on your music actually you singing on Merv Griffin. I think. That's right. Yes. Um, so you did you ever record anything or you just do a lot Television, of stage shows? I'm sorry, stage shows, yeah. albums. I have several albums on which I am listed and. Um, um, you know, when I started doing television, there isn't much correlation, unfortunately, right. unless you're doing variety uh, with singing and acting. Uh, right, right, right. And in New York, you can do it all. Right. In Los Angeles, when I came out here, I was not taken as seriously because I had done musicals. Really? It was considered a more totemic kind of acting. It was not considered, it was considered too projected. Too big and it was yeah. not... It was and not the kind of television acting that they wanted. That's what they thought, but I had started in television, you right. know, and soaps and stuff. So I was able to reform my abilities and, and bring them down to a consumable level. Right. It's interesting that they think just because you can only do one. Like, you're, this is your acting style, and that's it. You definitely cannot adjust for other forms, which well, seems Well, we all so tend to slow. typecast. Even, you know, if yeah. you have a plumber that's really good at some kind of toilet, you probably won't hire him to do, you know, your electricity. I right, mean, we all right. Tend that's to, true. To cliche and box yes. people into little categories. Well, I mean, you often uh, a lot of your roles, and in, in, um, especially guest starring roles, and obviously on, on Parker Lewis, but you're, you're you often play sort of authority figures or doctors or um, lawyers or, or people in these sort of positions. And did that just sort of happen, or do you sort of gravitate towards those kinds of roles, or is that just sort I of the? I guess I don't know. I have a fast mouth, you know. Right. So I think that that's kind of why, because I hang, handle language well. Right. And I wasn't blonde or big bosomed enough, really, to, to book. <laughs> right. the, you know, they tried to cast me as the straight, attractive woman in a couple of movies, but I was never as successful. At didn't that. work for you. Did you yeah. feel uncomfortable in that role? Or yeah, it didn't serve my compulsivity. Right. You know, right. I, I, you know, to be that passive and that attractive and alluring just was not right. in my uh, bailiwick really. yeah yeah I, I could I could see that I, I could do it could. as a character right right as but, a dumb blonde or something right but it would be a little more broad than probably you know more of a, a sketch thing than like a you know say a Friday sketch than a full movie or something it'd be harder to stay yeah, in that it'd be room. kind of a waste of my my energy yeah. I think so. yeah no I would agree I mean you're great in those roles and it's just it was always interesting how Thank like you. on Newhart you I had a reoccurring role as a psychiatrist. That's right. Um, which uh, I was actually talking to um, Tom Snyder, not the TV host, but Tom Snyder, who produced Dr. Katz um, with Jonathan Katz. And oh, Bruce wonderful shows. show. And uh, one of his favorite, his favorite lines in a sitcom of all time is from a scene that you're in from Newhart with um, Peter Scolari. Right. And uh, I believe you're, you're saying something about a... Um, I can't continue our sessions because of uh, my feelings I'm for you. Yeah. yeah, and he goes, uh, <laughs> and oh, I said because of my feelings. He said, "You mean you don't you, like me?" He says, "You hate me," and you see very much the opposite. And he goes, "I hate you." <laughs> Yes, yeah. Brilliant. Uh, that's his, that's he was his great to work with. I love Peter. He's amazing. I, he's great in everything. And he, I think he does a lot of directing now and stage and stuff And I as saw well. him resurface on Girls, doesn't he? Play? Yes, I think he was on that recently, yeah. too. Yeah. So you, you're, some of your favorite shows that you had mentioned, your dad watched a ton of Westerns. Loved the Westerns. But and you did, never got that into them. Well, I like James Garner. I love okay. those black-haired, handsome guys yes, that yes. had a sense of humor. Right. Hence my, you know my uh, proclivity for uh, Soupy Sales, right. Steve Allen, any man with black hair and wit. And Garner seemed to be the wittiest of those characters. Oh, yeah. He was like a classic smart-ass character. Just, yeah. he was the most, and I mean, he was great. And he basically played similar roles in all of the kind of things he was in. Why not? But, He's yeah. such a great personality. He really was great at that. Um, and but, I remember my father loved Bonanza, and I liked Michael Landon, so I would right. watch it because he was handsome. Yeah. And then um, he also watched... Uh, the Rebel with Nick Adams. Oh, The Rebel. Playing I'm Johnny with. Yuma. Is, then that's a, that was a That Western was another well? one of those cowboy slot okay. things. In that, and he watched Sing Grey Theater. Okay. Um, these are anthologies before yes. your time, of course. But that's what we were chatting a little bit before about how the anthology is sort of a lost form now. Yeah. Which is interesting. I wonder if sort of web videos have sort of replaced that where people can do these shorts Maybe online. Maybe so short for the short attention span. Yes, exactly. The yeah. faster paced world that we live yeah. in now. And so you, you went to New York and you, the first jobs that you did were in soaps, as you mentioned. Mm -hmm. And then how did you go from New York out to Los Angeles because you do seem very, um, and I mean this as, as a compliment, very East Coasty to me mm -hmm. as a fellow New Englander. Mm -hmm. um, and so it seemed like you would stay in New York doing sort of stage things. And well, I auditioned for Laugh-In and the way I, the, the second generation yep. of Laugh-In, or maybe the third, I don't know. It might have been, yeah. <laughs> and uh, my agents at William Morris, who had signed me while I was in a, an off-Broadway show, said, 
put some of your songs, I write these odd, odd songs, right. kind of character songs, put some of your songs together and go on at Bud Friedman's you know, improv Oh, at the club improv, okay. So that he can see you. So I wrote an, and pulled together a number of songs and some patter between, mm-hmm. and George Schlaughter didn't hire me. The best advice he gave me was to tell me to dump the boyfriend I was with. <laughs> well, okay. I said, hey, I want to give you some advice. Yeah. I that was going to get be rid of that career. guy. Said, yeah, really, yeah. get rid of that guy. Um, but it led to Bud Friedman putting me on quite regularly. I was doing a Broadway show, and after the show, I'd toddle over, and Bud would put me on at oh, late hours. So this would there have been were very few ingenue female stand-ups at the time. Oh, absolutely! Yeah. I was way before Rita Rudner, who I was in acting class with actually for many years. Really? We were both trying to be serious actors. If you want to see Rita be funny, you should have seen her do Blanche and Streetcar. Now that oh, wow. that was funny. <laughs> I would love to see that. <laughs> but we had Elaine Boozler, and we had she was a waitress there, I think, for a while. She, right? Yeah, yeah, she was a barkeeper. And Bette Midler was around. Probably. She was doing her act just as I was coming onto the scene. She was wonderful. So really, the only sort of stand-ups that were somewhat established that were playing there frequently would be like Robert Klein or and David Brenner, David Brenner and Freddie Prince. Oh yes, was who, really happy who hadn't got Chico and the buddy. Man yet, right? He well, was this just was before that, way before the all hell broke loose for oh, wow. Freddie. So that must have been a really Very interesting exciting environment. Time we had such gifted stand-ups there, but again, being a woman, I got a lot of attention because there right. were so very few of us, and right. my delivery was much softer, right. and I had a lot of music in my act. So I started getting uh, flown to L.A. for pilots. Oh, wow. And uh, I was offered an overall deal at Paramount ABC. Uh, they wanted to do a spinoff of Laverne and Shirley called Ralph Potsy and Maxine. Really? So I okay. tested with those two guys, and it didn't go. Right. But I just found myself getting little jobs here. I was on Wonder Woman. Yes. You what know, was, with, do you remember anything about that? I do. I, they needed a Nadja Comaneci type. Okay. And um, I played her. I looked like I could really jump off of right, a, right. a horse, you know. I did the whole gymnast thing because I'd been studying ballet, so I was right. really in shape. And Rick Springfield played my boyfriend. Wow. Henry Gibson kidnapped me after the Olympics to be on his wow. Russian team. And Linda Carter rescued us. Henry Gibson, uh, he was always playing evil foreigners. Yeah. He was just like, let's he make him play this He was way over the top. Yeah. But he was really delicious to hang out with. So here I was on location, you know, and I always felt like an attractive woman. But, you know, next to next to Linda Carter, I felt like a thumb. I came well, up to about I don't know her if that's breasts. That's so But yeah, but she, I think she's sort of inhuman. Beautiful. <laughs> human, the beauty, yeah. So beautiful and statuesque. And anyway, Rick Springfield and I got to hang out. This is before his big hits. Yeah, he had just come over here from Australia and he had uh, prior to that done a cartoon show called Mission Magic really? that was about oh, Filmation did it um, who I think you might have done some work for with Super Friends around that time. Oh, I think I did one or two um, of them yeah. but it's haunted me. People yes, say you were a Super Friend. I yeah, you were doing background stuff I think it was I think so. uh, but it was it was a show that he was he played a singing magician uh, on an animated show called Mission Magic, and he did he did the theme song, and it was not a hit, as uh, as probably not a surprise, oh, <laughs> as it's not enduring. Rick. And then he did before he got um, whatever soap opera he was in a hospital, I think he was right, on, and then started doing the the music again. But He's that's very handsome. Yeah, I, his Lovely book's guy. actually very good. Uh, he did an autobiography maybe a year ago, oh. or two years ago. That's pretty interesting. Oh, I'll have to get that. Yeah, it's pretty interesting. Am I in it? I don't think that oh, you're in it. I don't know if he mentions Wonder Woman. He's forgotten me. He may have been like, I, if I write about Melanie, the whole book will be about Melanie and yeah. people. I do you know, tend to pull focus. Yeah, that you'll way. pull the focus on the whole thing. So you started getting these sort of guest roles and yeah, things. And yeah. then what was the first? And then I started auditioning for pilots, and I did a couple that didn't go. And then I, I uh, auditioned for Fridays. And I didn't get it. They hired the one of the ABC executives' wives. Oh, okay. And so I went into a deep depression because Larry David was on it. Oh, yeah. Bruce Mahler, like a lot of my stand-up buddies from New York. And then yeah. suddenly they fired her and then just about to tape. And I got brought in and Last shoved minute. into the ensemble. Uh, that must and have been terrifying. signed to a contract. It was. I mean, I was I was already depressed, you know. I was right. in my depression. It was like I had to reroute. A full swing of it. Yeah. And I could not. I tried to pull myself out. I didn't feel that funny. But Larry and Bruce were like my cousins. They were lovely So you, you to already me. knew them anyway from the improv and from yes. New York. So that must have made it a lot easier. It helped. I mean, they'd all been improvising together for a couple of weeks. And right. they already had some ensemble chemistry. So I feigned an ensemble Right, right, you know, right. Which I didn't you did it very well. It was Thank not you. noticeable. So, um, but I was somewhat set apart because I did the news. So right. I didn't 
didn't have as much ensemble work with everybody doing my characters and stuff as right. they had hoped. Which is what you had thought you were probably doing more like your stage act is what you thought you would get to do, and then you didn't quite... I didn't want to do my stage act. I wanted to be one of the guys. Well, right, gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. So gotcha. I was a good utility actress, and I played straight woman a lot to Michael Richards. Who right. was, he and I worked really, really well together. We wrote Very and improvised a lot of... Yeah, we wrote a lot of stuff together. We got along really, really well. Was that the first show that you... that people recognized you from yes it was remarkable how quickly celebrity you know i was like the girl right. du jour all of a sudden and right. i was getting barrels of fan mail and invited to be on you know other shows john davidson had a show oh, right. griffin had a show i was on all the morning sh- talk shows i remember oprah interviewing me uh, really? It was one of those hotel setups where they, they rented the Century Plaza Hotel and they had a different oh, morning show junket? in every room. Right. And you had to go from one room to the next it's like saying, speed good morning, Illinois, or right, good morning, right. speed Wait, dating, what state exactly, is this exactly. Yeah. speed dating television. And she interviewed me for, for some Chicago. Chicago morning show that she had. Because you were, in, in a lot of ways, for Fridays, you were sort of the face of that show um, for people. You They sort of positioned you as... as the, the Chevy Chase, for lack of a better mm-hmm. um, Or the Jane analogy. Curtin, with whom I had worked off-Broadway in The Proposition. Oh, really? She and I were in an improv musical together that came from Cambridge, actually. Oh, great, yeah. Proposition. Yeah. And, well, uh, I, think, um, I think Jane's from Cambridge, originally. Yeah, yeah. she's terrific. And uh, so here I was, hello, Jane, right, doing right, the same right. thing the she was, thing. which we were resistant to. We really didn't want to clone Saturday right. Night Live, right. but it was the network's... Uh, decision yeah. to do that. Yeah, and they were all definitely trying to get a piece of that Saturday Night Live pie, and even even NBC itself was trying to when, when they bought basically SCTV and put it on Friday nights, which um, was opposite you guys uh, for Great almost show. the whole run. And of course, they were on film, so they had a right. net. They could afford right. to make mistakes. Right, it wasn't. Couldn't. So you were just shooting it live? Totally it was, live. But to me, it was like theater. It wasn't, yeah, so you were probably more used to that. Yeah, we were used to covering errors when you're on stage. You, you have right. to. Right. If it's a flub, you just speckle it over with yeah. something. And so from that, I think I got suddenly recognized. I'd call a 1-800 number to pay a bill. Right. And they'd say, hey, Melanie, look what you did. And it was like, wow, everybody knows me. <laughs> That's good. So it's like from no, all to nothing. From nothing, and, and yeah. just overnight. It was very freaky, a little bit freaky. And kind of actually, I didn't have any bad experiences until um, people started showing up on the lot, like some guy... His name was Bill Ridley. So if I if I'm ever found dead, Bill Ridley <laughs> Bill did Ridley it. Bill Ridley did it. We know there's he, a witness. Um, he wrote me every week, thinking we had a relationship. I guess because when you look into the lens like a yeah. newscaster, people yeah, yeah. think they have a far more inter- intimate access to yeah. than they actually do. He actually showed up on the ABC lot with camera regalia and convinced the gate that he was a Just photographer work. there to shoot me. Oh, that's terrible. They brought him right to me, and I turned around, and he said, Hey, I'm Bill Ridley. How are you doing? I was like, Ugh. Yeah. So I said, Oh, well, come and meet the writers. So I yeah. led him into the basement where all the writers were catacombed, and right. I tried to get him off me. Right. And then they got stoned with him, apparently, and he stayed there for hours until they realized he was kind of crazy. It took them a while to realize he was crazy because <laughs> yeah. they were so... Well, they're up. writers. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> It'd be difficult to see it, not they, one of their own. They did get him out, but that yeah. was very threatening. And then apparently um, uh, an attorney got my address from the DMV, showed up at my house with flowers, That's started terrific. harassing. I had to threaten to have him disbarred. He would send me his depositions, like... Look what uh, I did. You know, t- Tom Goldstein versus Big Boy Hamburgers, and you know how he... Had <laughs> hey, won. I'm pretty good. Like, <laughs> That, that's very terrifying. I mean, it, it was really scary. It's it's strange the way people watch TV. I mean, obviously these people sound uh, unhinged and, and a bit uh, more severe than most people. But at the same time, and you may have experienced this when you were growing up and watching, uh, you know, things like Mickey Mouse Club. It's a more intimate experience generally than say a movie because you're not going out to do it. It's not an event. Uh, it's it's in your home and yes. it's every day. Yes, and so people tend to remember people they saw on TV, I think, more the people than the stuff they did because they see them so frequently. So Millions of people can see you. I mean, so yeah. so clearly right there. And they can, you know, once they got DVRs, I'm sorry, video machines, they could freeze you in any right. of, you know, horrible position. <laughs> right. You, care, you know, and right. suddenly you realize, oh, I have no control over my image. Which has to be terrifying. It like, was, there's something very scary about it that. Was, if you're really vain, it is really kind of terrifying. Yeah, or even just the, you know, being, being sort of weaned on stage stuff where it's, you know, it, you know, a couple, maybe thousand people, a huge difference. And once it's out in the air, it's gone. Yeah. It's done. Yeah. And so these things sort of last forever. Like the fact that you can look up some of the things you've done on YouTube now yeah. and just see them like that on your phone at any time. Yeah. It seems, you know, who, 
who would have thought that would have been the world that we live in now? And in some ways, it's probably cool to be able to go down and just look down. Do you ever watch that stuff still? Um, my mate, he had never known who I was my, when I met my fiancé. Right. And he saw that I'd been an actress. He did some research. And when he came to our second date, he was armed with more information <laughs> about me than I wanted up. him to know. Yeah. So uh, it was kind of... And I didn't have that sort of information about him. So it took me a, took me. That's a while an to unfair catch advantage. Up. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so... So you're doing Fridays, and then you started it, Fridays ended, but w was there anyone that you, because Fridays had guest stars and a lot of musicians, yeah. was there anyone that you met on Fridays that maybe came in as a guest role that was someone you used to watch or were really intimidated by or was one of the times you were really taken aback by um, meeting someone or you working know, As I mentioned to you, when I was in college, I didn't, and I went into theater, I was busy at night, so I didn't really watch television right. all that much, so I wasn't as familiar with television stars as I had been. Right. However, Al Jarreau, who was one of our musical guests, right. blew me away. I had seen him in New York when I was a stand-up. Um, I had come right from the Broadway stage out to uh, Los Angeles, so I didn't really know rock bands. I only right. know Broadway music. So every week it was like a golden book primer in rock acts. Yeah, I and mean, Fridays. I got to work with the, the Clash, the Boomtown oh, the Rats, Clash, Bonnie Raitt, Devo. I just loved. Yeah, I mean, uh, one of the things that Fridays tried to do was carve itself out as sort of the, the more cutting-edge musical act show. So there were some really uh, amazing groups on that show, and it must have been a very yeah. exciting time to sort yeah, of be at the forefront of this great. thing. Yeah, it was groundbreaking, and our, our director, John Moffat, sort of set the template for the types of MTV videos that came along later with all right. the handheld shooting from the drum point of view and yep. that was sort of uh, you know did imitated you, later did you know Andy Kaufman from the improv at all I did okay so you and did he already know him. Yeah. he was a buddy he was a nice Jewish guy and when we were doing Fridays he used to go to the uh, Fairfax High School track with me so I could run at night and he right. would keep me company and he turned me on to macrobiotic food oh, very and nice. so we hung out a lot. Sweet, sweet guy. It was yeah. really a shock. And I thought he really did go too far. On that in that sketch specifically well, or just, just generally about everything. With he, all the wrestling uh, women and the Yeah, I just think he turned everyone against him and that yeah. kind of negative energy. I don't know if it had any influence on him, but Yeah, I mean it's almost definitely... like he knew he had a time bomb, Ken, yeah. because he was meditating twice a day and eating macrobiotic food when he was in his 20s. He was right. way ahead. And it was almost like he knew there was like a time limit. He was more in touch with what was going on with himself. Sort yeah, of. he sort of knew internally that he was not, he had to be very self-protective. So he was like, life. let's just burn it out, kind of, maybe? Maybe, or he just knew that he was not maybe going to make it. I don't know. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. There were only three networks at the time, so obviously there's millions and millions of people watching these shows. So you go from, you know, the pilots didn't get picked up, or these guest roles, which were still large, but, you know, Every week you're on the show for years, yeah. and you're sort of the face of the show. And that was the time that you got Battle of the Network Stars. Oh, right. Battle of the Network Stars. Yeah. So how did that come about? Well, I had never seen it. It was a completely different genre. We fancied ourselves as extremely hip and above right. like normal television. You know, right. We were not the spandex crowd. And I know that the kids on the kids, the guys on the show said, oh, don't do it. It's just right. so mean. Prime, it's so prime time. Right. But my manager that said, you know, this show is not going to run forever. We hate to break it to you. You <laughs> right. need to start thinking about the future. You need to think about doing a mainstream kind of series. Right. So they talked me into it. And um, I had the thrill and delight of uh, knocking Tom Selleck into the water a couple times. Yes. Uh, dunk a hunk kind yes, of style a with a baseball. And you're, so you're, you're on the ABC team and your captain was Robert Yurick, I think, That's who was Spencer right. for Hire yeah, later. Right. Um, I don't think you guys won that one. Oh, I have no idea, I but I, I, I thought won. it was so much fun getting to fraternize with all these people I had seen at events and occasionally yeah. on television until we had to play a touch football game and we were all lining up facing each other and suddenly they were like, flaming nostrils flaring we're really, really serious now? and i got yeah. like scared and ran off the field yeah oh yeah because i wasn't working out i mean people were really working out in those days we didn't have any time we were shooting six days a week right. and working and rehearsing writing all the time so i had played racquetball but these people are like right they were working out they're gonna win they this had show. trainers and i yeah. was scared shitless so oh i, I could imagine for it. i could imagine and, and you guys probably felt somewhat removed from the as you, th you said you know prime time is almost like a slur around the uh probably around the office yeah. so that must have been extra strange to sort of 
be just thrust into that world all yeah, of a sudden. Yeah, yeah. We fancied ourselves as so cool and above it all, and you know. However, I kind of liked you know all kinds of people, and yeah, I fraternized and had fun. Yeah, it seems like it would just be at the very least kind of a crazy lark to do for a day of some like I can't believe that this. It was great happened. to be outdoors because I don't know it doesn't it's not that glamorous shooting in what it is basically a basement room right. for six days a week. I did not see it in natural light. <laughs> right, right. We were in air conditioning, fluorescent lit. It was like being in your father's tool closet. Right. Basically. And you're out in Los Angeles, which has wonderful weather, and yeah. uh, of all the places to be locked in a basement, it not was, quite the best place. Right. So we shot in Malibu at Pepperdine University, and I had a day in the sun. It was wonderful. They let me keep all my athletic gear. Oh, nice. I nice. didn't have athletic gear, and we had stretch limos. Each one of us had a stretch limo. That's pretty. Yeah, that's it's sort of the, that show is one of the sort of um, last bastions of the almost old Hollywood system yeah, they were right. still kind of treating things like right. you know it was the 1940s and it must have felt like yeah, I'm yeah this is right I'm yeah a big star this is the whole it thing. was fun I you know I didn't think it would be lasting forever also I found stretch limos extremely um car sickness inducing because the front of the car would go over a bump and then five right. minutes later <laughs> you'd you would go up in the back up into the air and yeah, it i always seemed like a comfort it's not as comfortable i always asked for a lincoln town car when yeah, i had the opportunity yeah. yeah so after that you um so after friday's ended you did some more guest starring roles but these were all comedies at this point i think pretty much well um I wanted to do film. You right. know, I fancied that I wanted to be more of a serious actress. And so I turned down a sitcom deal. Uh, my manager said it was a big mistake, but I first first of all, I was very burned out. Right. Oh, I, I had imagine. been approached by Dick Ebersol to come to New York and do Saturday Night Live. Really? And I said I was so flattered, but I just needed to rest for a while and learn yeah. about life. I had been so isolated for a number of years. Right. And... Um, you know, I got occasional guest star things on New Heart or yes, other shows, yes. but again, it was it was slow because I was very fussy for a few years. Right, because you just want. I mean, I imagine that it was it was like being in basic training or something the whole time you're on Fridays and Saturday yeah. Night probably would have been that, but even more so. Yeah. Although, did you when you came out here? Did you always? have the thought in the back of your head like it's sort of temporary and I'm going to eventually go back to New York? I went back and forth. I was very bi-coastal. Uh, you know, I'd always have like a cavernous bag with me. Right. One of those bags with 20 compartments so I could just jump on a fl plane and fly back. Right, right, right. Because everybody was so happy here. It made me very suspicious. Yes, that's... I, they didn't have that cynical, edgy energy like I was yes. used to in New York. <laughs> yes, I identify with that as a as a New Englander in the yeah. East Coast. Yeah, it's and very, very so different. so beautiful in Los Angeles. It gives you a very strange, you know, it's sense of reality. Pod people-ish, yeah, it's a little strange. And well, then I think when beautiful kids were told go to Hollywood and, and you'll be a big star, they all kind of propagated and had right. beautiful children, and right. they all live here. They run the restaurants and the gas stations. Everyone is gorgeous. Right. It's like Australia with criminals. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> they sent them all here, and right. they just that's the ingrained. That's the fourth generation. Of, right. Uh, this was the beauty city. Yeah, here. it is very weird. Yeah, when you exiled go exiled here, here, if you were beautiful, your auto mechanic and your plumber look like models. Yeah, it's very, and then very you strange. go to uh, the Midwest and you see normal people. It's always like it's kind of a Shock. Surprising. Yeah. They're all emulating Hollywood stars. Yes, that's they true. They all pull it off. Yes, they try. They try. Right. And so the next regular series that I think you had, if it was probably Parker Lewis, that was the next Yeah, I think you... I did a, a series of episodes on Wise Guy. Was okay. that before yes. or with, after that? I don't uh, remember. With Ken Wall? Yes. yes. So John, Wise... I played opposite Jonathan Banks, who was so oh, yes. wonderful on Breaking Bad. Yeah, a Wise Guy was a huge show for a while. And then wonderful. the network... Um, messed with the order of the episodes and they didn't air a few and it, it, it changed the night and it was it was one of those shows that everyone was was like this is being treated criminally and yeah. it ended up getting canceled but that was a dramatic role it, it was, was a very cop show. dramatic yeah i played jonathan banks kind of mistress and then kevin banks was on i'm sorry kevin spacey was yes. on our our series he was and, the villain i think on that show, yeah, he? yeah he was having a kinky relationship with his sister right right he was a fun guy to hang out with. he's kind of he's smart ass he's smart because Kind of oh, guy, I bet. You know? Yeah, it's exactly. Hard to, like, like really you think. take him seriously. You think he's having a real conversation, but you get the feeling he's kind of sizing you up and right. assessing you to go in for the kill. Right, like he's walking you down this path just to just turn it What's on you at any second. Me? Yeah, right. I mean that's the feeling you get from Kevin. Almost like he's his... gifted. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, he, he was he was terrifying on that show as this sort of very cold. Um, it wasn't called a mob boss, but some sort of he was a crime head. Definitely. So again, you so you try to do a couple of films and you didn't. Mm -hmm. They didn't. They tended to put me in Animal House type of films, which was not to my taste. Right, but right. But just because you'd done Fridays, yeah. that's why they were kind of putting you in these types of yeah. movies. And then I got cast on Parker Lewis Can't Lose for Fox. So I had went from being famous on three networks to being 
famous, uh, being uh, famous when there were only three networks, right, right. to being uh, famous when there was a new fourth network. Right. And then I got Rugrats, which was on the new kind of fifth network, which was yes. Nickelodeon, and it became a very, very big hit. Bought Those this are, house, actually. Oh, from Rugrats? I've had more staying power, oddly, with that show than any other. It also had a spin-off called All Grown All Up. All Grown Up, right. And most people probably, Parker Lewis and Rugrats are probably the two things that you're most known for. It's I guess. The majority of people, I guess, at this point. Yeah. Um, and Parker Lewis was, so Fox had started in 87, but was still sort of a weekend network mm -hmm. until about 1990, 91, which is when Parker Lewis was one of their first shows as like a full-fledged network mm -hmm. and you when you went in for that how did it differentiate itself from sort of these animal house type shows when you were well i actually had tested for parenthood ron howard okay. series yes. that year and i was ed bigley jr was i in had that. callbacks for that and i really really wanted that I actually took a Parker Lewis on, a, on the rebound. Right, right. What role on Parenthood were you up for the... Uh, one of the parents. Okay. But it was a really beautiful script, and I was surprised it didn't go. They've revitalized it now, of yeah. course. It's quite a hit It now. was... The original one was... They, so they, they lasted about half a season, and it was okay. It was very good, but well, it didn't do very revenge, well. that was my revenge. You yeah. know, it was really good, but it didn't last. Right, and Parker Lewis right. ran on for three years. Yes, three yes. Seasons, and uh, the role was written like a cartoon. She was described yeah. as apoplectic. I read the, the script and I said, this is an animated, this is like yes. an animation. This is written like animation. It's going to be very hard to shoot, very costly. And I was right. I mean, right. 16 hour days. Oof. I was exploding or something was exploding in almost yeah. every frame. There were so many special effects to set up. It was grueling. However, I love the kids. And they yeah. wrote, they began to write really, really well for Miss Musso. Yeah, your character definitely evolved a lot. Uh, over the seasons and became more of a person, I guess yes, is the best way to say it. a more it. vulnerable person. Yeah, because she started off, it was it was just an antagonist, basically. Yeah, you know, um, and also an, an antagonist that was like Ava Peron running a, right. you know, a South American country. I was running this yeah. high high school like I was right. a dictator. It was a Mary, very sort of Mary Warrenov type role, like from like Rock and Roll High School kind right, of. Right, uh, right. And then, yeah, and then you become this, uh, this vulnerable person and you get the motivations of a show, which is odd in a show that's sort of very surreal and cartoonish. But, uh, I mean, one of the things I loved about that show growing up was that um, and there was sort of a strange zeitgeist at that time with even on Fox which was like Get a Life or um, Nickelodeon which was like Adventures of Pete and Pete was that they managed to almost capture more what it's what it feels like to be a teenager or a child by having it be a weirder more surreal show mm -hmm. where everything is these sort of high stakes um, you know life or death type feeling situation so um, no glossiness exactly yeah. yeah and I think that's why that show kind of uh, endures and, and continues despite not being um, enough episodes for a traditional syndicated sort of package. We did get a DVD uh, first yes, two seasons. First two seasons. Out, uh, a couple years ago. Third seasons in Germany. That came yeah, out that's, DVD I in know Germany. I get a lot of uh, sexy mail from Germany. From Germany? Because really? my character wore, le wore leather a lot and was a oh, bit of a dominatrix. Yeah, so the Germans love it? I, think I get a lot. Of, and it's not even my voice, you yeah. see, but uh, you know, the, it's my face. Or my have voice. you actually seen it in German? I have. And actually in Europe, I saw it in Italian also. That's got to be very strange it seeing strange, someone else's it, voice coming out of the In Italian, she had a very high voice. And very strange. It didn't that, seem accurate to that's me. That's very odd. And then speaking of voices, I mean, Rugrats is, is voiceover work. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, despite your uh, minor um, involvement in the Super Friends, as you mentioned yeah, earlier. Yeah, hardly remember. It was Super Mario Brothers or something? I don't oh, know. something like that, yeah. yeah. So I, mean, I imagine those are like a one-day job. It was a one-day job that's haunted me on IMDb. Yeah, yeah. So, yes. But Rugrats, though, was you were there from the beginning, and you, you play Mrs. Pickles, basically. Uh, Dee Dee Pickles yeah. and also her mother, uh, the Yiddish character, Minka, right. who's right. an old Russian. And was that... Uh, what, how different was it to do an actual cartoon versus what you thought was a live action cartoon with Parker Lewis? Is it? Um, well, it was a lot easier physically. Right, God absolutely. Knows. You yeah. don't have to wear makeup or doing heels a or a bra. You know, right, it's right. really an that's easy how they pitch it to people. Come and, in, no bra. Yeah, and um, the cast was fantastic. Jack Riley, who had been on the original Newhart show, actually right. played one of the patients. Was my husband. He has this wonderful kind of flat, vulnerable mind. He's yes. just wonderful. Um, I really enjoyed doing the pilot and then forgot about it. And it takes about a year to animate a right, right. pilot. And a year later, they invited me to a screening, and I watched this thing, and here is my voice emitting from this strange creature, right. this odd thing, and it was sort of delightful. And then it got picked up in small little increments from time to time. Right. 
But in rerun, it got to be such a blazing hit that one day I was paid $25,000 to record a car commercial. Really? Just uh, voice and car it, Yes. In fact, I said, do you want a shoe shine or something? Right, right, terrible. right. I was right. only working Jack Riley and I worked for maybe five, ten minutes and made twenty-five grand and residuals. Crazy. So wow. it was... Uh, all for all my kind of disdain for doing anything that wasn't live action, it, right. was, it was really a cash cow. And you sort of avoided commercials a lot when you were coming up, and that's yeah. you know most actors that's sort of their their bread and butter for a long time. And they do a lot of commercials, but you that, was that I the first commercial really, you really I did? I did do Ring Around the Collar when I lived in New York. Oh, did you really? And McDonald's, which really paid for the acting classes. Right, right, right. Um, and I did a lot of voiceovers, but I never really enjoyed going on commercials and doing, yeah. doing them and stuff. It just didn't feel like me. So you would do commercial voiceovers? At the I time? did a lot of, yeah, commercial voiceovers. In the early days, there were a lot of sketch comedy style review, comedy review type of commercials. Okay. So whenever they needed a an Elaine May sound alike, right. I, I, would, I would become Elaine May. Oh, and that's do the interesting. Spots, you know, because she certainly wasn't going to do them. Right, right. And I uh, did a lot of character stuff on then. So uh, Rugrats was actually my first animated audition. And but you I, had a lot of experience, it sounds like, doing that sort of well, thing. Well, distracting my dad and mom from fighting. Right, exactly. I got to do a lot of that. Exactly. And so would you, is there anything you watch now? Like, do you, are there shows that you watch every week now? Or is it sort of like... Yes, we have our ritual television watching of 60 Minutes. Okay. The, the Good Wife. Yeah, Breaking everyone loves Bad. The Good Wife. Yeah, Breaking Bad. Well, it's a Sunday night ritual. We yeah. actually like Breaking Bad a lot. But to when you were flipping through the TV guides, it was you said it was sort of Sunday night ritual when you were a kid as well. Yeah, that seemed to be that the was night, the night we were remembered. allowed to relax and watch television. I had to do homework most of the weeknights. Right, so you're still sort of Well, doing I that. guess 60 Minutes is the Ed Sullivan of my day. <laughs> right, right, right. Ed Sullivan was uh, just a doorway to all that was possible as a variety artist. Right. It was extraordinary. My father felt that he could call who was going to be a star. You know, like he'd see Barbara Streisand. He'd say, oh, she's going to be big. How accurate you think was so? it? Yeah. Or the Beatles. He'd say, you know, I think they're going to be big. I- <laughs> It'd be funny if he just said that about everybody, but we only remember the ones he was correct on. Yeah. Like there was be, that Topo Gigio oh, is going right. to be huge. The That's going to be the biggest thing. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. Uh, yeah that, but there was a lot of Sunday shows. We watched Omnibus, which I wish they could. Is that an anthology? Or? It was a uh, kind like I guess CBS Sunday Morning is now, okay. except it's like a news that magazine. show is so hampered by kind of PR yeah. people yeah. that yeah. just shove whatever movies. But they had Leonard Bernstein, oh, Jonathan Winters improvising. I mean, I they had John an array Winters. of of cultural uh, influences on that show. They even right. did short dramas and oh yeah. So I remember being allowed to watch that. I also remember Supia Sales. I had a thing for Steve Allen, Supia Sales, all the black-haired funny men. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was Steve Allen, who was the precursor to Stephen Colbert. I mean, yes. he didn't oh, look yeah. alike. He's, he sort of is credited with sort of inventing the format of the modern um, modern television talk show. Right, and, and like Stephen Colbert, he was a real show-off. He right. liked to show he could write music, right. he could do this, he could do that, and he managed to, to flex it all. And he, 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 he uh, this is actually something you two have in common, because you hold some some patents, correct, for inventions? I held one patent. A patent, and he did as well. He was always, uh, he, he would always brag about all the, the patents he had for oh, inventions. Yeah, I invented yeah. a gray, white, gray water recycling device, which allowed you to flush your toilet with your used shower water. Right. And a, a, re, a rotating drain in your shower, very different kind of permutations of <laughs> Right, that. right. Couldn't sell it, though. I no, don't. but still, I mean, there's not many uh, people fun. out here in the business that probably hold patents for... It's very expensive to have an idea, let me warn yes, you. Get Getting a patent attorney, getting your idea secured internationally, extremely, extremely expensive. Wow. Yeah. So, did you say you was? It, did you mention that you met Steve Allen? Or you I did. With? I yes. got to. Yeah. I was a production assistant at EUE Screen Gems in New York City for uh, about six months before I got my first Broadway show. Right. And Steve Allen actually did a, a car commercial for us. Interesting. And he played a white piano in it, which we let him keep. Oh, really? So he and Jane Meadows. <laughs> Hello, Steve. What we're on the uh, commercial, and I got to hang out with them and take them to lunch and take them to their hotel and. And he was very. Did you he was very mention nice. that you watched him? And oh, yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I was very proud of myself, though. I never got knock kneed around right. stars. I felt quite at home with them, and uh, he was very accessible and lovely. Yeah, he seemed from everything I hear about the interaction things, he seems to be that way with people. Yeah. And he, you got athletic shoes to battle the stars. He got a white piano. He got a white piano. It's a slightly that different day. time. Yeah. yeah, for being nice to the crew. How did he? 
How did he get that out of there? Uh, well, they dismantled and took it out. There was a garage. Okay. You know, the, yeah. the studios, they have garage doors. Right, right, right. The but whole it, wall opens up. It seems up. like a weird thing to just take home. And yeah, to Hollywood. Home. I think they sent it to Hollywood, actually. Really? From New York? I believe so. Well, speaking of, the, of crews, you, um, I was a huge Mr. Belvedere fan and a show I was sort of fascinated with. Right. Uh, it was very... He was a wonderful stage actor. Christopher person. Hewitt. Yeah. Absolutely. It was very strange that he was on this sitcom. It was it a weird was, cast, generally. I mean, British you know, actor just took the money, basically. Yeah, yeah. Know? But he was good on it. I mean, he was, he was su- surprisingly great at comedy, and he was great at um, just a, a barely contained rage would yeah. be a good... Uh, and being the, the foil for Bob Euchre, was it? Right, yes. Yeah. Who's, you know, not an actor. He's a... A sports, a sports announcer, announcer I know. which is very strange and it's based on these 1930s Clifton Webb movies right uh, a lot of the people who were running that show were from Barney Miller yeah. which was a very good sort of serious show mm-hmm. and then they, they go into this show so you you did a guest spot on that show and you did what did a, I play a cop or a I, detective I believe or... you were a detective yes yeah yeah another authority figure on the show uh, yes I guess I was I don't remember the show that well I don't remember that I had very interesting material but I do remember that because I was traveling back and forth to New York City so much, and I always had a cavernous purse with many mm-hmm. compartments, I could never find my keys. Right. So I had a device on my keychain that when I whistled, would whistle back at me okay. so that I could locate the keys in my cavernous purse. And uh, one day we were supposed to record, we were finally recording, they were doing a camera check, and all of a sudden they shut everything down, stopped the show, they delayed like two, three hours, and I finally, you know, brought my coffee over, and I said, right. what's going on? They said, well, there's a whistle <laughs> in the in the camera. I mean, it keeps triggering, there's like a 60 megacycle hum getting, and it's got all the equipment screwed up. Right, right. I said, oh. So I just moved my purse off the set into the dressing room, and then everything resumed right. again. Right, just and pretended I, you had no idea what it was. Yeah, yeah, and then finally I confessed it as I was oh, leaving that it. week to the uh, to the director and he was like what do you know how much money <laughs> we lost i'm gonna send you a bill for this wow but um you know i was able to find my keys quite easily that's there. more important really yeah. i mean if you couldn't find your keys you would have been trapped there maybe to this day you wouldn't have yeah, been able to leave that yeah. set so that was the kind of incident i remember sorry to say yeah. from mr belvedere and i also remember having uh, hanging out with chris because he was a theater lover had so you met I. him before that or i had just... met him at a hollywood party okay you know he's so a lovely just bonded gentleman over theater but one of the most influential British actors in my life was Patrick McNee. Oh yes, the Avengers. We did a pilot called the called Empire, which was about really? an old New Jersey firm di- trying desperately to get into the modern age. When was this? Oh, it was between series, I guess. Okay. It was in the late eighties. Okay. And Patrick McNee played the head of this aging company. Yeah, yeah. And um, I remember that we would just linger and hang together, and he he told me that he was a world traveler and never had to pay for hotels. And I said, well, how do you pull that off? And he said, you know about 20 good jokes uh, and you can mooch off of just about anyone in the world for about three days and then leave and then never have a home big enough to reciprocate. That is very fascinating. So he was a great rock contour, and he managed to travel free and stay with royalty, stay all over the world. Never, wow. Never had a big apartment, never had it, you know. You know I, so I always remembered that, to have about six good jokes yes. at least. Yes. Have you ever tried that? Yes, I did very well in England, actually. Really? Yeah, I actually mooched off of friends of his. Yes. Well, Patrick McNee was probably, uh, you know, I, I imagine he also had a little bit of juice being like, I'm Patrick McNee, for, yeah. especially in England. He's I mean, the very Avengers dapper was, and funny yes. and dry. Yes, he's sort of the quintessential that guy I mean he yeah. is uh, did you watch the Avengers when I did yeah. I thought Diana Rigg was wonderful she's now on Game of Thrones yes yeah yeah I've heard wonderful that well. crone yeah she's she's, like, she's been in so many different things over yeah. over the years and it's uh, it's no, always just because people aren't on TV right now doesn't mean they've disappeared from oh, yeah, reality absolutely we all absolutely. tend to think as soon as they're off TV they're dead or right, some right, horrible right. homeless condition now <laughs> right. prevails but in yeah, a lot of cases we're having a, lot of a things. good time oh yeah they're doing perfectly well but I think with Diana Rigg she she She's always when I show when she shows up. I'm surprised because it takes me a few minutes to. She sort of is chameleon like in roles, and she was on uh, Doctor Who I think last year. Mm -hmm. And um, she's not a person who played. You know, it's not like they're just casting her to be Emma Peel. You know, thirty years later. Yes. Um, So I always forget that it's her. But the Avengers was uh, a huge hit over here. It was probably the first British show that really did well in mainstream audiences. And too. she was so sexy and brilliant and tough and smart. Oh, yeah, absolutely. You know, it was great to see an intelligent woman starring in a show. Yeah, that must have been very unusual because the only other show I can think of around that time was probably like Honey West. Um, oh, right. With, uh, which was a great show. 
Francis? Uh, Anne Francis. Anne yes, Francis. Yes. From uh, she was in one of my favorite movies of all time, The Love God with Don Knotts. Oh. That Nat Heinken. Uh, yeah, I remember meeting her, and she was very oh, far really? out. Was she really? She was very um, spiritually attuned before any of us knew what that was. Yeah, I very could see into that. ESP and Edgar Casey. Oh, interesting. And, yeah, in fact, she wrote a book about it. Oh, did she really? Uh, kind of an autobiographical book about hearing voices and. Oh, interesting. I'll have to check dimensions. that out. Yeah, yeah. A, I, I love a memoir. Yeah, and she was also in um, Forbidden world not forbidden world um oh man i'm forgetting the some name. sci-fi thing. yeah with leslie nielsen in the 1950s one oh, of the um gosh you know your television it's yeah it's not something i ever tried to learn so it just wow. sort of it just sort of soaked in i wanted to share with you being featured in tv guide actually oh, yes, yeah, we're... Uh, when i played miss musso i had received a lot of fan mail and uh miss musso myself as miss musso yep. red pencil the punctuation and spelling errors and return the fan oh, letter you really? and i would grade them and i would say no picture for you please send this back corrected. Oh, that's amazing. And a lot of people would obey. And you know. they would send them back corrected yes, and you would send yes, them a yes. picture. And then when if they got an A and they were well punctuated, I'd say, you know, you got an A well punctuated that's and I would fantastic. send them a picture. So they did a little write-up in one of the TV guides during oh, the Oh, that's period. amazing. I bet I probably have that one. Um, I can dig it up and maybe I'll, I'll scan it and send it to you. in the 90s? Yeah, it would have been 91. Or I'll, 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 I know I have it in oh, fact. Cool. I'll, 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 I'll dig it up and I'll, yeah, I'll make you a copy and I'll scan it. That's amazing. If you were to cheer and a jeer for television, either from your youth or now even for this week what would what would they be a cheer and a jeer for yes, television yes yes I think it's too good, and it just takes up too much of my attention. Too much time. Now. I am a John Stewart, Stephen Colbert, sixty minutes junkie. I think Amy Schumer is amazingly She's very, radical. Yes. Yeah. I'm looking to see who the next female talk show host will be. Yeah. Do you have any uh, people you think it might be? Do you have any? If you had a Surprise pitch me. There's so many incredible female stand-ups yeah. right now who oh, deserve yeah. a shot. Absolutely. And uh, we were saying earlier, too, that it's great that Maya Rudolph is doing a variety show, which is something that I'm surprised that hasn't happened already. It's a great step. Do you find that you, you tend to gravitate towards things like 60 Minutes and talk shows now because it's harder for you to get lost in characters being in the business and maybe seeing people you know on shows and it's harder for you to relate to them as their character? I was totally swept away by The Sopranos, okay. which was very like much like the metier of my hometown. A lot right. of Italian wannabes, to right. be big guys, taps on their shoes. Yeah. Totally swept away. If the acting is good, even if I know the actors, I get completely you can get captivated. Completely captivated. That's a good compliment, I think, to someone's acting. Yeah. Uh, and so that's your jeer. Uh, that also sounds like a cheer, though. That well, my jeer is not enough women yet. Yes. But it yeah. is changing. Not enough women directing. Not enough women uh, starring. Not enough right. women running a talk show in the evenings. Right. Uh, and my cheer is that, guys, it's getting better and better all the time. Yeah. It's better than a lot of features. Yeah, absolutely. I think that uh, the movie world has become sort of just big budget B movies, and so the quality stuff is definitely coming out on television these days. This yeah, is, I, I love television. Stuff. I'm looking forward to getting back inside it again. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Mel. I appreciate. The thank time. you. A pleasure. That was my episode with Melanie Chardoff. What a fascinating person. Just an amazing life. Her stories are fantastic. You can go to her website, MelanieChardoff.com. She also does teaching. And you can, if you're in the Los Angeles area, you can go to ChardoffTeaching.com and you can sign up for all kinds of classes with her, for voiceover, for improv, for all kinds of stuff. I highly recommend you do that. She's an amazing resource and you will be a better person for having done it. Uh, just a side note, Melanie shared this with me after we recorded. She got married and she actually wore Miss Musso's wedding dress. There was an episode of Parker Lewis where she was supposed to get married, her husband died in the show, and the people who make the show let her keep the dress still fits, she wore it for her wedding, perfect. So there you go, that's Melanie Chardoff. Again, please continue to email me at ken at iCanRead.com. I love hearing from you guys. Go to our Facebook page, TV Guidance Counselor. You can post things there and let us know. We'll have more contests on there and all kinds of stuff. Please go to Stitcher, go to iTunes, go to SoundCloud, subscribe to the show, rate the show, review the show if you like it. Help spread the word. I really appreciate it. And please be back here next Wednesday for an all-new episode of TV Guidance Counselor.